thanks for coming. Uh, I'm Ron Dieter. I'm the director of Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto. Uh, thank you for coming to this panel. Uh, we've got a really interesting group of people here. We're going to talk about uh, some of the uh, research that's been done and some of the concerns that people have about uh, threats that exist on the internet, online, in the digital world, uh, for human rights groups, for NGOs, and for journalists talk about some of the projects that are going on and activities that are happening and leave a lot of room in this uh, session for a conversation with uh, people in the audience because obviously there are a lot of people with uh, a lot to say here and so we really want to have a, a good conversation. I, I was asked to begin the presentation uh, by saying a few remarks about general trends in this area that I observe and then uh, talk a bit about the Citizen Lab, the, where we fit into all of this. And then we're going to go uh, to Bill Marzak, who's a Citizen Lab Research Fellow and uh, a, a PhD student at the University of Berkeley, who's uh, he's one of the co-authors of a report that was just published literally about 20 minutes ago. <laughs> so we uh, finally got it up. Um, and he can talk more about that report, but also the research that he's doing. Uh, which, by the way, often takes place in collaboration with Eva Galpern at EFF, and many of you, of course, know Eva. She will talk about the approach that she is taking with EFF and, um, and uh, what she sees as some of the most important uh, issues to address in this space. Um, and, uh, and then we're going to turn over finally to Enrique, who is really the architect of this panel. Uh, who is uh, the one man who put it all together, and he will talk about uh, the work that he's been doing, uh, both, I guess, at Human Rights Watch, but now at Benetech as well, and Marvis, and so forth. Uh, so to begin, <clears throat> let, let me just say a, a few remarks about where I see things going in this space. I've been doing research for, I guess, close to 20 years now, believe it or not, uh, on internet-related issues, and uh, generally speaking, I think the, the trends, at least as I see them, are, are getting kind of worse, not better. Um, I, I think uh, one uncomfortable truth that we have to uh, recognize is that in the wake of the Snowden revelations, regardless of what you think of, of Snowden himself and those res revelations, to me it's clear that in the short term, the reaction to it, the consequences and the impact of it uh, in many countries around the world is going to make things even worse yet. And that's something we need to kind of prepare ourselves for. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, if you think about it from the perspective of um, uh, a policymaker in power in just about any country in the world uh, that's not aligned with the United States, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to turn to their security chief and say, are we being spied on by the United States? And uh, the security chief will turn around and say, well, I can answer that, but I need $20 million in my budget, and I need to purchase specialized equipment to be able to do this. And oh, by the way, uh, these capabilities will also allow you to take care of that meddlesome opposition group of human rights activists that are embarrassing us. Um, on top of that, I think that uh, the trend over the last couple of decades is clear that cybersecurity is moving higher and higher on just about every country's agenda. Um, in many respects, this was inevitable. Uh, we kind of turned our lives inside out. There are, you know, something like 15 billion devices connected to the internet, including everything uh, from just our laptops to critical infrastructure. So inevitably, this would become a major security issue. Um, but of course, what uh, cybersecurity means varies widely from country to country. So uh, from, for some countries, that may mean we want to keep the networks functioning and financial traffic moving without disruption. But for other countries, it may mean uh, preventing criticism of the government in power or uh, arresting people uh, for mobilizing around certain key events. And I think uh, when you reflect on that, when you think the vast majority of growth in the next uh, five years is going to come from uh, countries that are flawed democracies or have gone through democratic transitions recently and are reverting back to something else, uh, say in the case of Egypt, or um, uh, are authoritarian or autocratic regimes, this paints a pretty uh, troublesome picture. On top of that, of course, is the fact that um, uh, 
thankfully, many organizations are quickly adopting these tools to do wonderful things. Uh, everything from digital humanitarian projects to uh, you know, crowdsource election monitoring efforts and so on. Uh, however, my concern is that the, the adoption of, of new technologies is, ha is happening faster than habits and practices around security uh, can take place. And if you look at a context like, say, Sub-Saharan Africa, a region that we're increasingly concerned about, you see a, a dangerous or a potent combination there. Uh, internet growth rates on the order of several thousand percent per year. Uh, many failed states, zones of conflict, autocratic regimes, and then lots of well-meaning NGOs and human rights groups that are quickly adopting these technologies but don't have a lot of capacity to even think about, let alone deal with adequately security issues. Uh, meanwhile, uh, <coughs> adding into the mix of all of this is what I lumped together as the cybersecurity industrial complex. So um, after 9-11, uh, of course, there was a, a great deal of concern focused on analyzing big data, essentially all of the emissions that we leave behind us as we go about our digital lives. This is a huge market, uh, both on the consumer preference side, but also on the military intelligence law enforcement side. And in fact, many of the same companies service both market segments. So you have, for example, facial recognition companies that, uh, that, that sell to Facebook or other companies like that, but also sell to the CIA or FBI. Uh, many billions of dollars are, are feeding into this marketplace, which are putting into the hands of policymakers capabilities they never before imagined. Deep packet inspection, social media tracking, uh, cell phone monitoring, uh, advanced spyware, as we'll hear about later. Um, and that market shows really no signs of fading. There have been some really important developments in this area. Legal cases launched by EFF, I think, are one important uh, illustration of that. Uh, but generally speaking, the trend is that things are getting a lot worse rather than better in the short term. Uh, turning from sort of high level observations to uh, where the Citizen Lab fits in in all of this, Citizen Lab was founded in, in 2001, and uh, we're, we're not an NGO, we're not an advocacy group. Uh, I'm a professor of political science. The Citizen Lab is a research lab. Uh, but it's a research lab that's quite unique in terms of universities insofar as uh, we don't fit with any disciplinary silo. So although I'm a political scientist, uh, the people who work at the Citizen Lab are computer scientists, engineers, lawyers, sociologists, and so on. So we apply a mixed methods approach to all of the research that we do, broadly from a human rights perspective. Uh, our aim is to uh, produce as much evidence-based research that is reproducible in order to raise awareness about the issues that I just uh, spoke about. Um, to give one slice as an example of the type of research that we do, because we'll hear more about another element that Bill and, and his colleagues have really been leading up associated with the Citizen Lab. A different area is what we call uh, the targeted threats research. And to give you some background, this goes back to at least uh, 2007, when uh, associates of the Citizen Lab uh, got in touch with uh, members of the Tibetan community, many of, uh, well, at least one of whom is here right now, Lan, and, uh, and, and her associates, and Nathan as well, um, where uh, they suspected that their computers were being monitored, uh, obviously by uh, what they suspected to be the Chinese government. And for us, that was a new area of research. We were interested in working with them to try to analyze uh, exactly what the nature of the threat is that they face. And um, uh, that the, the first uh, iteration of that resulted in uh, the GhostNet uh, report, which was really an accidental discovery that the same attackers who had infiltrated Tibetans and, and their uh, computers and had also uh, infiltrated literally hundreds of government agencies, including ministries of foreign affairs and so on, uh, I, I think was the first cyber espionage report to produce that level of evidence in the public domain. Uh, and I, and it's, I think it's still a landmark for that reason. After that report, uh, we looked at the project from a, typically like a research perspective. We said, well, we, we started with 
maybe one or two groups, let's broaden it out. And, and uh, for the last three years or so, we've been working not just with the Tibetans, but about a dozen uh, non-governmental organizations who signed up to this study, have been sharing hundreds of emails with us on a regular basis. Uh, and uh, through that, we've been able to get some insight into uh, the nature of the threats that they face. Um, we will be releasing a, a report that kind of summarizes the Targeted Threats Project in the next little while. Um, the bottom line here is that when uh, politicians and policymakers speak about cybersecurity, it's clear to me that there's a major gap here. So uh, if you look at any speech by, say, President Obama on this topic or any other world leader, uh, when they talk about the need to address cybersecurity, they're talking primarily about government networks and big business and the financial sector and so on. Left entirely out of the equation is civil society. And this is the major problem I think we need to address when we talk on this panel, is that uh, generally speaking, perhaps there are some exceptions, but from the research that we've done over the last three years, it's clear to us that NGOs, big, small, are, first of all, regularly targeted by uh, increasingly sophisticated, in some cases, commercial spyware um, that is uh, compromising the integrity of their net networks and putting their operations at risk, including real human lives. And many of them have no capacity to deal with it. Uh, their budgets don't uh, give them uh, enough resources to be able to, in some cases, even hire a network administrator, let alone someone who can go and actually investigate and deal with and, and remediate the problem. And um, while Citizen Lab has been doing this research, EFF, Privacy International, and other groups likewise doing uh, research in legal cases, and they've been picked up all over the world, we have a, a real problem right now, and that is there's no clear uh, avenue of, uh, for groups to go to to be able to uh, deal with the threats that they face. And I think there's especially an urgent case for donors to recognize and begin taking steps uh, to remediate. Uh, I could go on at great length to put all of this, but I'd rather uh, turn it over to my colleagues to talk about what they've been involved in to kind of uh, take up uh, some of that conversation. So, uh, Bill, over to you. Uh, thanks, Ryan. So, as Ron mentioned, um, I'm a research fellow in Citizen Lab, and about 20 minutes ago, we released the final chapter in our three-part report on a company known as Hacking Team. Now, Hacking Team is an Italian company based in Milan, and what they do is they sell commercial uh, surveillance spyware exclusively to governments. Now, this is software which the government attempts to install on your computer or, or mobile phone. And it gives them access to your files, to your Skype calls, and even allows them to turn on the, the microphone and, and webcam on your laptop or phone to spy on, on things happening in the vicinity of, of, your, of your devices. And uh, the, the first kind of main part of our report looked at how this is used and regularly abused by governments to target um, civil society as well as activists and, and journalists. Um, so the first part of our report focused on how the Ethiopian government apparently um, was using the spyware to target journalists based in the United States, um, reporting on Ethiopian issues. Um, so in spe specifically there was this organization, uh, ESAT, which is a satellite channel run by the diaspora. And, and these guys began receiving suspicious files via email and via Skype. And it turned out that these files were designed to install this sophisticated uh, espionage software on their computers from the team. So this is, this is kind of an example of, of some of the research that we do at Citizen Lab, um, working with these, these groups who are likely to be targeted, analyzing these suspicious files and tracing the spyware to, in some cases, its commercial vendors. One of the really cool things we've been able to do in this space, besides just identify the, the types of spyware, and these types of commercial spyware, is also trace them to other governments around the world. So once we have one instance of, of one of these types of spyware, we are able to determine what we're looking for, and then we're able to do scanning uh, and 
and locate other countries that are also using this, this same type of spyware. So in the, in the case of in the case of Huntington, we were actually able to trace this to 21 governments around the world, including very impressive places like Uzbekistan, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, um, United Arab Emirates, Oman, um, Turkey, etc. Um, is a very interesting list of countries. Um, these companies like Hacking Team, and there's, there's another one called uh, Finfisher out of Germany, they claim that this is um, software designed for lawful intercept. Um, in other words, designed to investigate serious crimes. For example, terrorism, drug trafficking, child pornography. Um, but more often than not, we see the two examples of this. Uh, spyware being used to target uh, journalists and activists. Um, we saw it used against activists in Bahrain, uh, and <coughs> activists in the United Arab Emirates, uh, and an American citizen critical of Turkish charter schools in the United States. Uh, there's more and more, more examples. <coughs> so the latest point that we released is actually very interesting which looks at how this, uh, this spyware is, is designed to be hidden. In other words, if, if someone's infected or someone receives the spyware, it's designed to be untraceable back to the government which targeted them. And the way that this is often done is by, you know, the, the government has to communicate with, with infected computers and phones to receive the information. Um, but often this information is bounced around the world to disguise its true destination, in other words, where it's actually going, which government is actually consuming it. Uh, and we uncovered that a large part of this network of, of bouncing traffic around the world actually exists here in the United States. Um, commercial hosting companies like Lino and Rackspace are running large numbers of servers. I think we found 80 servers being run by Lino um, that were designed to funnel data gathered by the spyware back to governments such as Uzbekistan, Ethiopia, number of other repressive places, um, which raises some very interesting uh, legal issues. Um, but, but all in all, um, I guess the takeaways are, this is very scary stuff. Commercial spyware is, is on the rise, um, and it's, it's uh, despite um, my best efforts of giving advice to journalists and activists, it's often the case that um, they either can't follow the advice. Um, for example, I have been working with, with these Ethiopian uh, journalists in DC for a while, and I advised them, um, you're being targeted by attachments. Don't open attachments that, that you receive. If you receive a Word document attachment, open it up in, in Google Docs, which is this, this great thing that you can do now if you have a Gmail account and you get a Word document as an attachment. You can actually open it and edit it without ever downloading it to your computer and putting yourself at risk. So I, I advised the viewers to do this, but I later found out that they weren't doing this, and I asked them why. And they said, oh, well, we, we have to edit these Word documents, and we write in Amharic, the language of Ethiopia, and it is a special script which is not supported by Google Docs. And in fact, we have to install specialized software on our computers to edit these documents, which require downloading to your computer and, and opening them in Microsoft Word, thereby putting yourself at risk of infection. So I think in, in terms of <coughs> steps to, to protect and, and defend uh, journalists and activists, uh, at least from this, these types of, of spyware attacks, it's important to understand, I think, what the landscape is, like why people are doing the things they're doing, and maybe very unexpected reasons, um, like I didn't anticipate about the, the, the unharmed text. Um, so anyway, uh, very scary stuff. Um, and you know, I think there's, there needs to be some, some, uh, some good work done in terms of surveying, in terms of interviewing, in terms of testing, to understand why uh, journalists, why activists, why, why NGOs uh, and NGO workers make the decisions they do uh, with regard to security, uh, and where um, we as a community can, can help. Uh, thanks for that, Bill. Uh, one thing I was going to mention, just based on the remarks about attachments as, as a vector for, for malware distribution, in the uh, targeted threats report that's yet to be released that we're preparing, one of the conclusions that we draw based on this three years of research and interviews with, with the <coughs> groups that were involved in that project is that their harm could be reduced by something like 85% if they just stopped opening attachments. And uh, in fact, the, uh, the Tibetan communities have a campaign called Detach from Attachments uh, <laughs> that we should look at, and maybe Vlad, you could talk about that later on in the discussion or later, um, because there's, it's, it's an, an interesting campaign 
um, which points to the importance of uh, a, just some basic awareness for users uh, would be very valuable in this space, especially for journalists. And um, so I want to turn now to Eva uh, to take over from here. Eva, Hello. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Eva Galperin. I work for the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, you may have heard of us. Uh, we're a group of lawyers, activists, and technologists working together to make sure that when you go online, your rights come with you. Uh, and I guess if there is a sort of activist equivalent to an interdisciplinary organization, uh, we are it. So uh, I work on the international team, so uh, primarily I spend uh, most of my time thinking about uh, the global internet and, uh, and global threats, and particularly vulnerable populations, uh, such as activists and journalists. And uh, to that end, I have spent the last, I would say, two or three years uh, collaborating with uh, researchers at Citizen Lab uh, in, uh, on a number of projects. Uh, including uh, sort of a, a mapping of the malware space in Syria, uh, a report on malware in, uh, in Vietnam, which was particularly hilarious because they targeted me, thus making things so much easier for the collection of malware. Uh, and, uh, and most recently, uh, EFF has launched a, uh, a legal case. We have sued the nation of Ethiopia over uh, their uh, spying on a uh, former Ethiopian citizen, now US citizen, living in uh, and around Washington, DC. Um, and they spied on him by covertly installing a copy of FinFisher on his computer. They managed to spy on, uh, on a number of Google searches and also on, uh, on some Skype calls. And uh, we're not entirely sure what else. Uh, but because we are absolutely certain that this happened, thanks to Bill's analysis, um, we are able to sue the nation of Ethiopia under the U.S. Wiretapping Act. Because it turns out that spying on people's phone calls uh, without any kind of warrant or their consent is illegal in the United States. <laughs> so uh, this all started because we had been working on a whole lot of other, uh, a lot of other malware projects. Uh, but usually, when it comes to these projects, I, I am the middleman. So a, um, a citizen lab researcher came to me and said, so we have these photos, and these photos are being used in the targeting of malware, uh, and we think they're of this Ethiopian group called Ginbot7. Do you know anybody from Ginbot7? And I said, well, no, but my job is to travel all over the world talking to activists, so I'm pretty sure I can find out. And uh, it turned out to be rather tricky, because Ginbot7 uh, has been uh, named as a uh, terrorist group by the government of Ethiopia, uh, largely because they oppose the government of Ethiopia, which they find terrifying. And uh, they, are, they are not known as a, or they are not considered to be a terrorist group by uh, any other country. Uh, and so they're extremely cautious about new people approaching them and saying, hey, I hear you have some sort of security problem, let me take a look at your network. Uh, so it took me about three months to find somebody from Ginbot7 who was willing to talk to me and to spend enough time slowly talking to them about what we thought the problem might be and earning their trust to the point where they would let us take a look at their computers. Um, Somewhere around the three-month mark, uh, Citizen Lab published their Ethiopia report, or rather their, uh, their FinFisher report, which included a report of the command and control server uh, that they had found uh, in Ethiopian IP space, indicating that uh, the government of Ethiopia had, uh, in fact, purchased FinFisher. And uh, I think that this was uh, really instrumental to gaining the trust of uh, the members of Gimbot7. So uh, what's particularly interesting about this lawsuit is that, uh, well, not only that it has its roots in this long-time collaboration between Citizen Lab and EFF, uh, but I think that this is really the, the next step. This is our, our first step on the offensive uh, against uh, international and warrantless surveillance. Uh, 
Uh, we have spent the last several years just trying to map the landscape because it's not as if the companies that make these tools uh, publish lists of their customers. And it's not as if the customers publish lists of, of places that they buy these tools from. And so the only way that we can really have some idea of who is selling what to whom and therefore taking, uh, taking part or helping to enable uh, human rights violations all over the world in places like Bahrain and Morocco and Vietnam uh, is essentially by reverse engineering it. Either by finding the command and control uh, servers and you know, sort of getting some idea of where, uh, of, of where these, uh, where these uh, spyware tools are being sold to in that way. Uh, and also by simply talking to the activists, talking to the people in the community and uh, gaining enough of their trust that they're willing to send me their number. Uh, so that we can analyze it and have some idea of what is being used to spy on them. And we have uh, we've sort of combined our forces in order to get a, a very small and partial map of some of the world surveillance landscape, uh, which is more than we had before. Uh, but our first step on the offensive uh, is suing the government of Ethiopia. And I think that this is particularly important, especially in light of uh, EFF's uh, long-standing cases against uh, against the NSA and its uh, program of mass surveillance. Uh, EFF launched its first lawsuit against AT&T for its part in the NSA's mass surveillance uh, in, I think it was 2006, meaning the, the case is now old enough to go to grade school. <laughs> and we launched our most recent case uh, against the U.S. government uh, in a matter regarding the Verizon, uh, the Verizon order, which uh, was one of, I think was the very first document that came out of the Snowden revelations, before we even knew who Edward Snowden was. Uh, and we launched that case, I think, last year. So we've been at this a long time. We're, we're, the, we're the old school litigants on this. Uh, but the world in which, uh, the real politic that the NSA says that it's playing is essentially people in the U.S. are protected. Uh, the NSA is not supposed to spy on U.S. persons on U.S. soil. But when it comes to the rest of the world, the NSA insists that the rest of the world is fair game. And this is bad news for me because I spend most of my time talking to non-U.S. persons on non-U.S. soil, and I'm not particularly enthused about the notion of telling them they're completely out of luck when it comes to protecting themselves against NSA spying, and that the only uh, tools that they have to defend themselves are the technical tools with which I can, uh, I can help uh, associate them with. Uh, they should have legal protections. Uh, you know, the law still applies. International law still applies. Uh, but as far as the NSA is concerned, uh, they can do whatever they can get away with. And a world in which intelligence agencies can do anything they can get away with and anybody out of the country is fair game, is a world in which Ethiopia feels free to spy on a US person, on US soil, however the hell it wants, without getting any kind of warrant, without engaging in any kind of due process. And so if you are a US person, suddenly when you're talking about mass surveillance, you don't have to just worry about the NSA spying on you. Maybe you don't mind if the NSA reads your email. You figure, hey, I've got nothing to hide. But do you mind if China reads your email? Do you mind if Russia reads your email? Do you think that uh, the GCHQ should be reading your email? Do you think Vietnam should be reading your email? Or Ethiopia? This is not just the, the big players that we think of as, as being particularly strong in the area of cybersecurity. Any country with, you know, a couple hundred thousands of dollars to give to a company like uh, like Finn Fisher or Hacking Team is now a player in this game, and we are not safe from any of them. And so I think that's the reason why uh, EFS legal cases are are so vitally important, and that's also the reason why I'm so enthusiastic to see how they're going to play out. Thanks so much, Eva. Um, Enrique, over to you.
Um, so I'm Enrique Pilases. I work uh, at Benetech. I did the human rights program there. Uh, Benetech has been providing a free and open source uh, information uh, management and encryption technology for the global human rights movement for about 10 years. And uh, I'm very excited for, uh, about being at Rights Fund in 2014, and I'm particularly excited about being able to join a conversation with the Foundation and the Citizen Lab about a topic that I think is uh, increasingly key for the advancement and defense of human rights. Uh, the Citizen Lab and uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, among other organizations like Human Rights Watch and Privacy International, uh, are, are paving the road to a better understanding of the scope and uh, implications uh, of global surveillance. So for those in the audience that have the ability to support or contribute, I would like to ask you to make sure that you engage with them at the end of this presentation. This is definitely very important work. Um, so, um, let me tell you something. Um, I think that one of the reasons the work is important and one of the reasons I'm excited about this panel is because organizations like uh, theirs, uh, Human Rights Watch and uh, Privacy International, are, uh, are going to become key for us to understand the implications of human uh, of, uh, surveillance against those uh, bits of civil society that are the most relevant. And that they are the most relevant because they are struggling for accountability, transparency, and justice. You know, people like activists, uh, human rights defenders, and journalists. Um, so again, I, I would really like to encourage you to support their work uh, and contribute in any way you can. I'm going to switch to my second page. Mm. I'm going to drop it. <coughs> so, uh, I'm here to, I guess, this my phone. I'm here to briefly share with you some ideas um, around why this type of research is uh, important and how it can help us better on address the impact of surveillance on human rights defenders and journalists. So, for many years, uh, for many years, uh, security experts, uh, privacy advocates, and whistleblowers have been having warnings about the growing capacity of surveillance that states have. They have also been warning about the risk of technology in the hands of the organized crime, and increasingly about uh, the implications of uh, uh, companies and corporations uh, being, being the brokers for our privacy and anonymity. Um, so recent events like the revelations uh, around uh, Edward Snowden whistleblowing the infiltration of the New York Times and other media outlets, uh, the use of technology by the Mexican cartel, and the targeted attacks by governments in the global south against the uh, NGOs and dissidents beyond their borders, have provided us with uh, evidence of the scale and targeted nature of surveillance against human rights defenders and journalists. And in, in the context of human rights documentation and journalistic work, um, the effects of this uh, increasingly technically advanced uh, surveillance can be tremendous. Uh, uh, and, and while I believe that there's much work to be done, uh, um, like the groundbreaking research that you guys are doing, I think that we have enough evidence to say that uh, for those that live and work in the last mile of the telecommunication networks, and that have little understanding of the technical meaning and, and implications of surveillance and counter surveillance, such uh, effects can be catastrophic. Um, and to, uh, to add what my colleagues or co-panelists uh, uh, cover, I would say that to understand the effects of, uh, of, on check surveillance, it's also important to consider other angles. Uh, uh, like the long-term implications that this has on the ability of many organizations to further support the human rights movement and the development of free media. And for example, human rights practitioners and defenders have largely relied on international cooperation for the adoption of technologies for the advancement of their causes. And the most recent revelations of large-scale surveillance programs by several governments, in many cases with the cooperation of or support of the private sector, can undermine the credibility of many well-intended uh, capacity building and technology transfer efforts that have long supported partners around the world. So, um, a better understanding of surveillance could inform a uh, threat model <coughs> and uh, risk assessment among developers and field implementers, as well uh, as the design of capacity building and technology transfer strategies. In terms of uh, field intervention, for example, uh, I believe that a better understanding of this topic uh, can help us convince the large and growing number of international organizations involved in the collection and storage of data from vulnerable populations uh, properly manage and secure what they collect even in the absence of uh, international legal standards and solely based on the do no harm principle. In terms of capacity building, uh, what I have mentioned uh, could not only inform the curriculum design, but also allow us to strategically address those issues that the general public finally has put attention to. And, and uh, stating what I hope is uh, obvious for this community, uh, 
methodologically sound research, as uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation and the Citizen Lab work, uh, shows, is key to shape uh, the public debate and advocate for policy changes that respect, uh, promote, and protect rights in the digital age. Uh, it, also, it, it also seems possible uh, in, uh, that in a day not too far from today, the use of malware, for example, could be documented with enough evidentiary weight uh, to support transitional justice efforts in a place like Syria. <coughs> um, and to channel some of the colleagues that were not able to be on the panel today, I think it's important to consider what the governments and companies can do. Uh, this is the part that I really want to read. Um, so support, uh, I think that there's three or four things that governments and companies can do based on the research that you guys are doing. I think that it's important for uh, both go governments and companies to support calls for greater regulation greater regulations on the export of certain uh, powerful surveillance tools at both the international and the national level. In particular, states were part of the Wassenaar arrangement on export controls for conventional arms and dual use goods and technologies. Uh, that's the part that you have to read. Uh, should, should not wait and, uh, and, and sort of uh, implement the new controls as soon as possible. For all those of us that were not aware of this before, uh, in late 2013, uh, new export controls were agreed uh, in a number of areas, including surveillance and intelligence gathering. Uh, the second bit of this is that governments should ensure that there's adequate public debate over when various kinds of surveillance uh, technologies should be used, under what authority, and what safeguards. Uh, and we as a civil society should uh, be demanding greater insight into how uh, governments are, are, are employing these tools in, in our name. Um, in uh, the, the last bit of this slide is that for companies uh, that market and sell surveillance tools, I hope there's not many of them here, uh, there is growing recognition uh, politically and legally that they do have a responsibility to prevent and address abuses uh, linked to their business. Companies must uh, take concrete steps to prevent abusive uh, use of their products and, uh, and services. And uh, the EFS uh, Know Your Customer Framework is a good starting point for uh, how to implement this in practice. And um, so finally, or so, uh, I would like to emphasize some of what I have said before. Further understanding uh, the depth and prevalence of attacks against human rights defenders, citizen journalists, and uh, media workers is key. And understanding the implications, uh, impact, and harm of such attacks, as well as to actively debate the best path forward for the mitigation and prevention, uh, both from a technical and a policy perspective, is something where I think this community can play a key role. Um, at Benetech, uh, we're looking to contribute uh, our tiny grain of sand uh, in that direction by supporting uh, the measurement of uh, the negative impact of technology on human rights defenders and journalists. Uh, as a result of discussions with uh, partners, supporters, and uh, techno activists, we believe we can do some uh, with a framework uh, for the collection, preservation, and sharing of information on the impact of technology on the safety of human, on the safety and security of human rights defenders, uh, with the goal of uh, providing secure and privacy-aware access to systematized information on the topic. So I want to thank you all for the opportunity to be here, and I look forward to learning about what type of things we can do together to advance the world of human rights. Awesome. Thank you very much, Enrique. Uh, I want to get into discussion from the audience already. There are people uh, raising their hands, so uh, uh, I will be uh, taking a cue, so just put up your hand if you want to get into it, and I'll do the best I can. And maybe, if people don't mind, it's up to you introducing yourself when you speak. Is there a microphone in the room, by chance, if there's you? not. There's not? We can uh, use this one. There's one, you do it. there's one here. It, it might require some sprinting around. Okay. But what one? Yes, back there. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Vahid Grizami with BizCloud and Ethics and Tech. And the question that I have for Citizen Lab and EFF is where do you, today, uh, the data that's being captured by the NSA resides not just at the NSA, it resides at its defense contractors like Booz Allen Hamilton that stood and worked at uh, back in the, uh, during the Daniel Ellsberg's time. It resided at places like the Rand Corporation, Computer Science Corporation, a lot of the public companies that actually are doing the data collection. 80% of the NSA's budget is outsourced. So can you talk about where is the line and distinction between private companies' access to data as well as the public companies? Because you know Obama has announced that as part of his review of NSA, he's looking at giving the data to the private sector to hold on to. The data currently is resides with the private sector. So maybe can you talk a little bit about 
what Obama's vision of this is and, and uh, how is this th differentiated between uh, the private sector and, and the government agencies in the future? So uh, I'm happy to take a crack and then we can go along. Uh, I, I think this is a very important topic for discussion. One of the uh, points that was raised during the Obama's uh, presentation on the NSA that really disturbed me was how suddenly the whole conversation about metadata collection had li been legitimized and normalized. So what went from being, hey, this is bad, the government is collecting all of our metadata, transformed in a subtle uh, shift of, you know, Obama's very eloquent uh, in, in the speech to, yes, we had to collect it all, but the way we're going to do it is we're going to transfer it to a third party. And I, I thought at the time, well, who's it going to be, like Target or Walmart? Is that gonna be? And it really disturbs me, this idea of like a big holding tank for all the metadata. But security aside, more troubling was the fact that this had been normalized as part of the conversation. Um, generally speaking, I think, when we speak about accountability and oversight, I believe that what we're doing collectively here at Citizen Lab, and what EFF is doing, what Privacy International is doing, and many other groups in this space, is a form of distributed oversight. Right? So in the age that we live in, we can't just build oversight mechanisms that rest within government structures, you know, judges and so on. We need to expand it out. Why? Because the vast majority of the data that we're talking about is in the hands of the private sector. And we, meet, we, we need many more points of oversight that come from uh, civil society. Uh, I think the part of what we've been aiming to do, at least from the Citizen Lab's perspective, is to begin the process of legitimizing this type of research. Um, so if, for those of you who are familiar with universities, it's not an easy thing to do that. So Bill comes from a PhD, he's doing his PhD in computer science, the type of research that Bill is doing, it's, it's a pretty tough seller, and traditionally has been, within the conservative departments there. Uh, and the training that computer scientists and engineers go through tends not to have this component to it. So in order for Bill to be able to do what he wants to do, it has to be made credible within the research communities. The same is, holds true for the political science you know, When you go through political science, any social science, you have no technical training whatsoever. So in order to build up this distributed oversight capacity, beginning in the universities, we have to overcome disciplinary divides and make this type of research uh, legitimate. I could talk much more about that, but I'd rather if somebody else wants to chat. Well, I, I just had uh, one additional comment, uh, which is that uh, yeah, by reframing the problem as a problem of where the government is storing the data rather than a problem of you know, mass warrantless uh, collection of data. Uh, I, I feel that the Obama administration was engaged in an epic act of point missing. Uh, I would say even a deliberate act of point missing. Uh, there is absolutely no question that our our lawsuit is based on mass collection, not that they're keeping it somewhere we don't like. Sorry, yeah, I'll, I'll be better. Uh, right back there. Over here next. You know, here you go. My name is Maryam Amarsadegi, and uh, we have an e-learning project for Iran human rights um, education called uh, Tamana. And my question is about um, uh, the point that countries like Iran are not going to um, do bad things, particularly to people on U.S. soil, if the American government isn't engaged in those things. So NSA practices are not necessarily harmful, um, but they, they are very harmful when taken into the context of the message that it sends to governments of repressive regimes and what they, then they can do to us. My question is, do you think that those governments of Iran, of China, wouldn't be engaged in those acts if the United States wasn't? I think it's naive of us to think that if the United States holds itself back, then governments like of, of Iran are going, to, are going to also hold themselves back. I feel that this is a mischaracterization of my argument. Uh, I have said that a world in which people can spy however they can get away with spying with no real legal oversight internationally is essentially the world in which the NSA uh, claims we live in. And uh, I certainly think that Iran agrees with that. 
this is this is the very basis of real politic. Uh, what is particularly interesting about the EFF case against the nation of Ethiopia is that we are fighting against that. Uh, we're saying that if you are a if you are a country and uh, you spy uh, in the U.S. on a U.S. citizen uh, without going through the proper legal channels, which honestly you can't because you know good luck getting a warrant. Uh, then you should face the legal consequences because the rule of law matters in the United States. That's why we have an entire floor of lawyers at EFF. If we did not believe in the rule of law, we would just be the technical floor. Uh, and believe me, probably be a lot cheaper. <laughs> so I, I think that this is actually just a very important first step to fighting back. Okay, thank you, Eva. So back, oh, uh, over here. So this, Person down in the front first. Here we go. No, no. Actually, there's. There we go. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, my name is Rachel Greenspan. I came in 2011 as an activist, and now I work for the U.S. Department of Defense. So say what you will about that. Uh, one, one comment <laughs> about people who question contractors being involved in having data is that um, the defense industrial base that has classified cleared contractors are regulated by the NISPOM, which they're in the process of revising. Uh, there are also a series of cyber readiness inspections being conducted uh, about cyber threats to the DIP. So it's not a perfect process, but it's also, there are, there are things there um, for, for people who, who who may think it's a vacuum. Um, my question is that there's a duplicity which has been alluded to, which is that governments that criticize US surveillance from one department to turn around and then you know, ask the US, you know, hey, can we have a copy of that tape or you know, do you have that other you know, tap on someone else? Um, and there are different legal authorities. There's counterintelligence, security, law enforcement. They all presumably have some realm of legitimate legal authority, right? Whether that's being abused or not. Uh, so, if you could peel back the curtain, how can civil society work with governments? Um, what would assure you that vulnerable populations are being protected, assuming that surveillance is never going to go away entirely? Um, and then, is there a double standard, which I think the previous question alluded to, where you're more comfortable with the U.S. or Great Britain doing something that becomes very scary when an authoritarian regime is there? Oh. Can you hand the mic to the next person while Eva answers? We can start with the rule of law. I think that would be nice. Uh, I, I think that our wiretapping case illustrates that we don't even need to write new laws. We can simply enforce the laws that are already on the books. Uh, there are already mechanisms by which, if the Ethiopian government had, uh, had felt that, uh, that our uh, client was, in fact, breaking the law, could have petitioned the U.S. government for the right to uh, to tap his phone or possibly to tap his computer, but they did not do so. They chose to go uh, to go around and covertly install uh, Finfisher on his computer, and indeed to uninstall it shortly after the Ethiopia report came out. Uh, the only reason why we were able to get any forensic evidence about this spying was that the, uh, something went wrong with the uninstall process and it was not clean, and it left evidence behind, which is how we know that they, that they spied on these, uh, on these <coughs> calls. So uh, I would settle for the rule of law and enforcing the, the laws that are already on the books. I'm not even necessarily calling for reform. Uh, though EFF has been extremely vocal in calling for you know, reform of, uh, of surveillance law, and specifically the Patriot Act and the FISA Amendments Act. But in this particular case, if we could just enforce the laws that we already have on the books, I think it'll be a great win. I, mean, I, I would love to add just, uh, just uh, four or five words. I mean, I think that beyond you know the structure of uh, laws at the moment, I think that accountability and transparency are the two concepts that should permit that. And the reality is that uh, it's more an issue of um, leadership at the moment, that regulation. I mean, you have issues around clapper, for example. It's, it's unbelievable that you know, certain people that have been you know, caught in certain circumstances you know, have not been made accountable. So that, I think accountability is something that needs to be enforced. There's a whole uh, rendition experience, which is the John surveillance directly, but involves surveillance. That shows how 
you know, the, the U.S. government and other governments have been willing to share intelligence evidence with governments like the Libyan government. Uh, so I think that there should be, you know, um, a leadership uh, effort to, you know, promote accountability and transparency and make, as you said, you know, the, the rule of accountability. Okay, so we have down there. An administrative note, if I may. Okay. If you do not want to be recorded, you need to talk to the people that are doing the recording, like him and him. Otherwise, you'll be on record. I've been warned. No, 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 already, already one person is on the record. That's all well there. Okay. <laughs> Um, hi, I'm Kavitha. I work with the Committee to Protect Journalists, and I love your idea about distributed oversight. And I just wonder if you have <laughs> strategies for improving collaboration among organizations, and if we could be or should be sharing uh, cases in a more systematic way. So this is a great question, and of course, it's it's often difficult for a variety of reasons that many people in the room are familiar with. Uh, to get organizations to work together effectively. I mean, they're just basic issues about uh, physical proximity and you know, communications and so on. So it takes uh, constant hard work. And um, within civil society uh, generally, I, I think um, th there is a, a, a sometimes unavoidable competitive thing that goes on, where uh, it's not surprising because there are scarce funds, everyone's competing for the same donors, and. Um, there's a temptation, I think, in the worst cases, to try to um, do everything, one organization to do everything. Um, what I think works better, and if I had my ideal world, it would be where uh, there are niches performed by different groups. And I think where you see the most positive uh, outcomes are when, uh, at least for us, when research that we uh, have done is picked up and then pursued by partners who say launch a lawsuit in the Ethiopia case is a prime example of that. Uh, there are other legal challenges going on that, that we're partnering with Privacy International about that are very similar. Um, I think when it comes to organizations that work in areas like protecting journalists, um, there it, there's a, a nice uh, fitness that could happen where you know the role is to raise awareness about threats to journalists, but also protect them. And in order to protect them, we need to find out what the threats are. And the threats require research that you know can be done by edges. It's not mutually exclusive. That's not what we're talking about here. But there needs to be at least a, a place somewhere where the research skills and methodologies and techniques of investigation are refined. I happen to feel this may sound self-serving, but it's true. I happen to feel that universities have a special role to play here uh, when it comes to the subject matter we're talking about. Uh, the internet was born in the universities, and it's from the universities that uh, the internet will wither or flourish. And I think, uh, unfortunately, the universities have kind of dropped out of the equation when it comes to uh, standing up for threats to free expression and access to information that are happening worldwide. So the universities have to recover that sense of stewardship, and that, that's kind of what we've been trying to do at the Citizen Lab, is use the basis, the platform of the university, to engage in impartial evidence-based research. For us, I'll just one last remark, because I've got the platform on that. Um, it is a bit difficult, because as a matter of principle, Citizen Lab doesn't take money from governments or companies directly. And that means there's a small pool from which we can draw primarily research grants. Uh, I have to educate people about the fact that Citizen Lab, although a unit in the university, doesn't actually get money from the University of Toronto. That's not the way universities work. We actually pay rent through overhead, right? So we're, the university taxes us, and it's all through research grants that we're able to exist. Um, so there it is. Did going? anyone else want to say anything on that? Yeah. I, I think in terms of building this, this distributed oversight infrastructure, I think there's a lot of work to be done in terms of um, making sure that, that um, all stages of the process for investigating and gathering evidence um, about potential misuses or abuses of surveillance are uh, better understood and uh, systematized in a certain way. Um, I, I can't tell you how many times I've, I've been in touch with, with activists or journalists who have received something that's suspicious or uh, notice suspicious behavior or think they were targeted. And I ask them, I say, well, okay, can you please forward me that, that email? And they're like, oh, I, I deleted the email. Uh, and, and you know, potentially, 
out, like if, if the, uh, you know, if, if Ethiopian journalists have deleted their emails, if, if uh, you know, the, 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 there could be uh, missed opportunities for, for launching uh, a case uh, or for, you know, conducting further oversight activities or for even understanding um, where the spire is being used or what spire people are being targeted with. Or, so I, I think there needs to be better awareness of that, as well as uh, a, a more, a, a better way to, to, more awareness and a better way for people to kind of submit suspicious um, artifacts that they receive, or to report suspicious activities, um, to enable these to be gathered for investigation, and, um, gather evidence, and proceed with, with legal action or, or policy. So, okay, so, seems to be looking younger and younger. Thanks. Hi, uh, Commissioner Leaders. I just had a question. Um, so the panel's about you know, journalism and surveillance, and I'm wondering if anyone could talk specifically about uh, what the Obama administration has done uh, in, I mean, there's been a lot of talk about the war on whistleblowers and the war on journalists, you know, what they did with Fox News, suggesting they were co-conspirators, taking the records from the Associated Press. I mean, there's clearly a war on journalists right now. And the threat, I think, is not coming so much from the government of Ethiopia. I'm not concerned with the government of Ethiopia spying on me or anyone in this room, really, except for maybe a handful of people. Uh, but the NSA has its fingers, and GCHQ has its fingers in all of our information. So, so if anyone can talk a little bit about that and the idea that if a democratic, quote unquote, African American, Harvard Law educated president can do this, what hope do we really have for the future when the next president comes from the GOP or something? Thanks. Well, I guess that's all mine. Uh, I actually, uh, I will throw myself on that grenade. Uh, I actually just came back uh, from Chicago where I was speaking to the Media Consortium, which is a uh, consortium of uh, small independent news organizations from all over the United States. And the thing that they asked me to come and talk to them about was security. And it is precisely because journalists feel that they are under threat. And uh, while there was a great deal of discussion of, uh, of shield laws and of you know, how to legally protect your, uh, your anonymous sources, uh, with the law in, in such a scary place right now, uh, people weren't particularly open to, uh, to the notion that the, that the best protection they could gain for themselves uh, was uh, the protection they could get through uh, good operational <coughs> security, through strong threat modeling, and uh, through the use of, uh, of security and privacy tools and strong encryption. So I spent a lot of time training journalists uh, about strong encryption in order, to, uh, in order to protect their data, in order to protect their sources. Uh, and uh, that is it's one, sort of one half of the answer that we are, uh, that we are offering to journalists at this time. I would like to add, I mean, I don't agree to the war on anything in general, that's a personal oh, sure. statement, so I think that there's, there's, in this country there seems to be a war for anything. Sure. Years, there will be a war on immigrants again soon. And, and as a green card holder, I want to limit my opinions on the president. <laughs> <laughs> but I would say that there's a big difference between what most of us were talking in the context of direct attacks, you know, the model that has been crafted by the American government against the diaspora, and what the U.S. is doing, among other things that are doing in terms of mass surveillance. And I would say that, I don't, I mean, if I have to use the same terminology, I think that the U.S. has declared war on it. All its people, like all of us, the uh, nationals are not are being targeted by this. I mean, it's, it's kind of like a, you know, a, a weird statement to make, but uh, I, I don't think it's just journalists that need to be worried. It's lawyers, it's doctors, it's, you know, like the case workers. Everyone should be worried about this. And I don't think, I think that the targeting of journalists is just a result of journalists being in charge of defining what goes in the hand. I, I think, you know, to, to a large extent, the, the the solution to this to this problem is is very much uh, similar uh, for for journalists, uh, lawyers, etc., activists in the U.S. Uh, as well as in the case of Ethiopia and, and overseas. Um, and I, I think, to, to a large extent, there's maybe a well, this is perhaps oversimplifying it, but it's perhaps a three part uh, solution. Um, there, there's kind of three main things that you can kind of allocate resources into in terms of protecting people. Um, you, can, you can allocate the resources into developing technical solutions, for example, um, better tools for, for secure communication uh, and for strong encryption. Uh, you can devote resources to training uh, people to, to practice more secure behaviors, uh, 
uh, OPSEC, um, and things like that, how to deal with, deal with uh, sources. Um, and you can, you can put resources into to advocacy to, to try and get governments to change policies, to try and get the law changed, and to try and file court cases to, to enforce the rule of law. Um, and I, I think, you know, it's, it's not necessarily that we're um, avoiding focus on, on, on the U.S. I think uh, a lot, just by virtue of, of what we've received in terms of uh, samples, in terms of, of suspicions of targeting, uh, just by the you know, virtue of the structure of our, of our organizations and our connections has been uh, from, from overseas individuals and journalists. Uh, but I think very much steps and, and uh, solutions to these problems of, of surveillance uh, are, are the same, regardless of whether you're talking about journalists in Ethiopia or the Ethiopian government versus journalists or activists in the US. Okay, thanks for your question. Uh, now over there. Hi, Annabelle from Business and Human Rights Resource Center. Um, this question about the companies involved in this and how they see it is, is uh, maybe almost uh, advertising for them when they're exposed to produce so many governments that, that, that want their services. And, um, in terms of influencing them in any way, um, some are privately owned, like NetSuper, the main shareholder is a CEO. Um, when we try to put to governments, like we're in a very senior international that brought OECD, they get the same guidelines, complaints. Um, government accepted one with the German picked it out. The Canadian government very weak response um, on what it can do about net super. So are there any other pressures that you could in any way to influence the companies and just to say they're out there, they're in it to their own benefit, um, other activities we should follow. Uh, so I can take a crack at that if you're saying that's okay. Uh, so that, this is an excellent question. I, I think um, first of all we have to distinguish between <coughs> different segments of the market that we're talking about. So you have at one end of the spectrum, the kind of sharp end of the stick, if you will, are the companies that Bill and, and Morgan and others have been working on to try to uncover. Uh, this is primarily the commercial spyware uh, market, which sells exclusively to defense and intelligence agencies. Uh, in, you know, sells uh, through mysterious mechanisms, mostly at trade shows that are restricted. So it's a very it's opaque market. There's, Outside of that world, it's hard to know what's going on. So the first step is to actually begin the process of uncovering that this exists. Uh, I don't think the companies uh, to this uh, point really care so much about you know the, the research they've been mocking it to some degree. I would say if you look at some of the responses on Twitter, um, the but I think that doesn't matter because the more the research comes out. Uh, you have, on the one hand, clear, incontrovertible, deep wells of evidence, right? Versus blank statements that mean nothing that are based on rhetoric. At, at some point, I think uh, uh, that that will uh, become apparent. And uh, ultimately, I think in those cases, it is the legal uh, uh, pressure points that will matter most because we are seeing already changes to Bolsonaro arrangement to include exploits, uh, export. Uh, controls being discussed at many different forums. Um, I, I think we're seeing the beginning of a kind of digital arms control happening. At the other end, though, you have companies that are engaged in internet content filtering, in deep packet inspection, in mass surveillance, uh, all sorts of uh, products that are uh, not only dual use, they're actually all over the internet. They help the internet function in, uh, in businesses, in schools, in libraries, in, and at national levels. And, I think those companies are more ripe for arguments around corporate social responsibility. Um, and for them, it's more of a, a name and shame. Uh, unfortunately, NetSweeper, uh, you know, we have been doggedly at Citizen Lab, you know, tracking them down. We developed a way to fingerprint uh, through a variety of methods where their technologies are, are, are being operated. And it is really a sorted list, right? I mean, if, uh, it started out when there was a campaign against WebSense, which is a a company based, uh, I think, in this part of uh, the United States uh, to stop providing internet filtering in Yemen. When they backed out and put forward their human rights notice, uh, NetSweeper stepped in. And uh, they've, they seem to have a track record. Last week, we released another report showing that NetSweeper was providing internet services in Somalia to the three main internet service providers, including Hormuz, which in the past has, has had ties to Al-Shabaab. So this is a company that looks to be actively pursuing you know, the, the black holes of the internet. Um, bigger companies, though, I think are starting to feel the pressure, and, and you know, I've heard talk about some of them thinking about joining forms like GNI and so on. 
So I, I, I think uh, you know there are mixed methods that we can adopt to try to bring companies uh, around. Does anyone else want to pick up on that? Sure. Um, I can talk a little bit about uh, two things that EFF has done in order, uh, aside from lawsuits and technical research, uh, to apply pressure uh, first to governments and second to companies. Uh, the first is uh, the 13 principles on the application of human rights uh, to mass surveillance, which is a set of recommendations we make to governments, uh, essentially saying, hey, human rights law still matters and international law still matters, and here is what your, uh, what your surveillance uh, law should look like. Uh, your surveillance should be necessary and proportionate, which is the name of the website, necessaryandproportionate.org. Um, I think three or four hundred organizations have signed on to this, so EFF uh, is doing our, our very, very small part. Uh, and we're very excited about it. And uh, the second is a uh, white paper which we wrote a couple of years ago, which was a set of guidelines for uh, the uh, for companies that are selling uh, surveillance equipment to uh, to various countries, and essentially telling them uh, with the guidelines that they might uh, follow in order to avoid becoming a repression's little helper. Uh, the one very interesting side effect of these guidelines uh, is that uh, companies like Hacking Team now claim that they are following something very like our guidelines, only they can't tell us what they are. They have full oversight, but they can't tell us anything about it, uh, thus uh, demonstrating their, uh, their lack of understanding of exactly what the word oversight means. Uh, so there, when you when you create these kind of guidelines, there is a risk that they will be used against you, and that companies will try to use them as sort of a fig leaf. Um, but I thought that it was very important to uh, to put them out there, and uh, it is one of those things that you can point to when you're naming and shaming companies and say, hey, these these are specifically the things that you're not doing. I think there's also a role for for the type of research that that citizen lab does. I mean. One of, the, one of the really great examples of this is one of the first pieces of research that Citizen Lab did on, on targeted malware, um, at least it's targeted commercial, quote unquote, lawful intercept malware, was the case of behind the activists being targeted with, with FinFisher spyware. Now, this FinFisher spyware was originally made uh, by a company called Gamma, or Gamma International, um, and they, they since spun off the FinFisher business into its, its own business. Um, partly as a result of, of the pressure that I think that they faced uh, in the media. There's, there's been a tremendous amount of media coverage about this. It was on the front page of the New York Times. Um, I think the government of Bahrain and Gamma were both greatly embarrassed by this, this, this you know, bright spotlight that were shining on their activities. Um, Gamma, a company, of course, that had previously you know, been, been in, in the shadows. Um, these companies trying to make the shadows for a reason because they run very embarrassing lines of business and they sell very embarrassing uh, clients. So I think that, that by continually um, exposing and shining light on these abuses, um, it really does put pressure on the companies, both for, at the grassroots level and from the top down level, from governments um, who are asking uh, questions, as I hope the government of, of uh, Italy will soon be asking, you know, are we embarrassing ourselves? Is this you know, a national embarrassment to have this company you know, selling technology that's enabling oppression in, in all these different countries. Um, and I think that, that by continually uh, reporting and researching and highlighting um, these, these abuses and, and, and these, these companies' um, non-compliance with, with the purported uh, sales practices, um, it's, it's definitely a, a, an instrumental tool in, in pressuring them beyond what we can do. Great. So I'm, I'm getting the signal from the access people here. I'm sorry they agreed. Or we need to break, but uh, maybe we could have a chat. More, chat. More a short okay, maybe very quickly if possible. Thanks. Yes, thanks. My name is Maria Masani. I'm the founder of Human Rights Monitor. My question is to one person from the EFF. It's brief. Uh, what we have found that the uh, information collected by the NSA on Yemen is used for drone attacks and not human intelligence. So uh, the result is that many civilians have been killed in weddings, Yemenis actually don't mind if the US, NSA, if the U.S. drones kill actual Al-Qaeda member, but civilians is unconscionable. So what can be done about this collection of rumors 
by an NSA killing people by drones? Well, uh, again, the NSA maintains that, uh, that their mandate is to uh, collect intelligence on non-U.S. persons outside of the U.S., uh, which includes Yemen, and it's all done under the, the premise that it is uh, helping them to target and uh, kill members of Al-Qaeda in Yemen. Uh, as you have rightfully pointed out, uh, there has been a considerable amount of collateral damage, uh, mostly in the form of you know, entire innocent wedding parties being blown up. And, uh, and this is thoroughly unacceptable. I am not entirely certain that there is a, uh, that there is a legal route to take uh, in this particular case. Uh, but as I said, uh, the, the wonder of EFF is that we are, we are activists, technologists, and lawyers all working together. And I think this is a case where uh, the work, uh, where the activism work is especially important. And it is vitally important to continue to point out the enormous gap between what the Obama administration claims these drones are being used for, and claims this intelligence is being used for, and what is actually happening on the ground. Thank you for that, Eva. I, I want to say I'm honored to be on a panel with uh, Benetech and EFF, and I want to thank you all for coming uh, to this panel and, and join me in thanking the panel. Uh,